you hear a lot about it. It's a very good word. It's a very important word. The word is resilience, something you see in the popular, you know, nomenclature out there and um, all over all the sites and everybody's talking about, you know, we need to build resilience in people and how do you do that? And, you know, there's a real science behind this. Um, maybe we'll even do a full length webinar on this one day, but it's really, really important. I want to just talk about a couple of ideas, one in particular, but to begin with, um, what we're talking about when we're talking about resilience, you know, there, there is in life, there's a, a whole world of events that can happen, right? And those can go from small events that aren't traumatizing all the way to real bad things that are traumatizing. Now, those are the events. There's also a person, meaning you or me, that is experiencing those events. And we're either experiencing, even in PTSD, when you go to the diagnostic formulations of PTSD, it can be from, you know, going through something or even witnessing something that can be traumatizing to people. Now, here's a big thing to remember. The event is the event. Whether or not someone gets traumatized by that or disturbed or bothered or hurt or wounded or angry or whatever, that has a lot to do with the person. Okay, now look at it this way. It would be like, um, <clears throat> you know, after living in Los Angeles for decades, I've been through at least a handful of, you know, significant earthquakes. Nothing, we ain't gotten the big one yet. But um, one, of, uh, one of the things you always see is you'll have an earthquake and there are some, some buildings that go down and some that just sort of don't and they're fine. Well, the earthquake was the same, even in that particular area, but the resilience of the structure itself was what made the difference. The event is the event, but the structural capacity of the building dictates kind of what that event does to it. And certainly over the you know decades, we've gotten way better at, you know, building codes and how things are constructed to withstand that. Well, that's what we're talking about in resilience. We're talking about your capacity. Now, I, 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 never, I don't know why this stood out in my brain. It was, it was from, I, I think I was still a graduate student and I was doing volunteer work um, in a, uh, in a youth group. And I remember the, the professional that was there um, we had a meeting one afternoon and I said, so what are you up to? He said, I, he said, I had the most like eye opening morning. And I said, what was it? And he said, um, he said, so I met with two 16 year olds, you know, one first and then the second one, a different meeting the second time. And he said, you would not be able to tell the difference in how upset they were. He said, but what they had gone through was very different. The first one, and I won't list the, the trauma so we can all identify it from our own lives of, you know, what's very difficult, but she had had a major loss. Um, and he said the pain and all, he said, and he just had deep, deep, deep empathy for her and care and did a good job actually in helping her. He said the second one, Exact same level of distress. I said, well, what was the problem? He said, she found out she wasn't getting her braces off before prom when the pictures would be taken. Now, what's the difference in that scenario? Well, it's kind of like we got to look at who's it happening to. One of the things that is is kind of troubling to me, and then I want to get to the one point about resilience I'm going to make today, we'll, we'll do more at future dates because it's a big topic. But one of the things that stands out a lot 
is I want you to monitor the language that you use in describing something. Okay. The language that you use in describing something. Now, here's why. Because a lot of times, you know, certain words have connotations to our brains and our souls. And also the amount that the internal world gets activated and we react as opposed to respond. And to respond requires a lot of, 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 different brain functions, emotional functions, you know, interpersonal ways of, of responding to the person or the situation that really requires some part of the prefrontal cortex where, you know, all the good stuff lives. It'd be like the difference in, in a, a calculator or an abacus versus, you know, a big computer. They got way different capacities of what they can handle. Well, language is a big deal. Um, one of those that you hear, and trust me, don't send me angry emails about this because I am not in any way minimizing abuse. Okay. I have spent decades devoting literally decades of hard, hard, deep work in, in tough situations where people have gone through the worst abuse that I, I, you can't even dream of. I've walked out of sessions before and and thrown up and or sobbed because of just the story I was hearing. I mean, what some people go through when you're talking about abuse is seriously awful. But then a lot of times people will say, referring to a, you know, a spouse or a boss or somebody, well, you know, he's so emotionally abusive. And then I say, well, tell me about the abuse. And what they really are describing, they're not inflicting anything abusive or inj injurious or what should be. They're just like being an idiot or a drama queen or having, you know, reactions or something. And I, I'll give you a, f a funny example of this from our own family. <laughs> I, I laugh, I laugh at, at Tori sometimes <laughs> because she's, she's, she's so, um, she's so great about, you know, visually it, she's really good at, 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 you know, arranging environments and visuals and, and all that and how things look. And she's not, you know, obsessive about it, but she's really good at it. And, and so I remember one time when the girls were, were teenagers, um, she, you know, we had dinner and she, she asked me to clean up the kitchen. And so, you know, we all go do our things about a half hour later, she, she comes back in and she goes, girls, this kitchen is a disaster. And I just broke out laughing because I I grew up in the South where we had tornadoes. And, you know, when a tornado or like we had two houses we lost in floods and going into those places afterwards, that's a disaster. This kitchen right now is not, it's not a disaster. But when you hear those words, everybody's blood pressure goes up a little bit, right? And, 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 Sometimes we use words that that truly should kind of be reserved for things that merit their use, not only to keep from invalidating people that really do have disasters and really do have abuse. Not only that, but the language we use has a lot to do with how we respond to it. And I remember one time um, I had a uh, I was in a meeting um, and uh, one of the people there was um, was the governor of a state on the eastern seaboard in the northeast and and so we we were having this offsite and, um, and he he um, dur during the lunch break he's out on the 
on the balcony and he's on the phone and I see him talking for a while and he comes back in lunch and I said, I said, so everything okay? And he goes, yeah, well, he said, um, there's a few things. He said, I got an active shooter out on the freeway and I got um, uh, protesters have stormed the, the, you know, they're trying to shut down the house of representatives and, and then something that we got a power grid down and, and then he goes, eh, you know, just a normal, just another morning, you know, for my job. And I, I started laughing at just, he was dealing with it. He's dealing with it very effectively. He's doing a great job. But those are bigger than not getting my braces off, right? And he, the principle here is about how we, speak to ourselves and to others that will calm our system down. You know, cognitive therapists talk a lot about catastrophizing. This is awful. Well, no, I don't know if it's awful. It's kind of an annoyance or it's kind of this and the other. And one of the things in treating generalized anxiety and a lot of interpersonal problems is the cognitive world of therapy will really work on people's self-talk of how you are interpreting an event. Well, that gets to the words that you're using inside. And so with your kids, with your spouse, with your friends, all of that, listen, listen to the words you're using and not even just for their benefit. You know, if <laughs> I don't think we'll ever cure Tori of using the word disaster. She loves it. But if I walked in that kitchen, I'd go, hey, girls, you call this clean? I, it doesn't look clean to me. You know, a little different language, just because it's not my high button. I have other buttons I have to work on. But just listen to ourselves because of what it can do with others as well as what it does to our own brain. Because resilience has a lot to do with our capacities. Just think of what maturity does. If you have a family or you've been around kids and say there's a 10 year old in the room and a toddler and everybody's eating and the toddler spills their milk and they get upset, start screaming and all of that. And the 10 year old is laughing at them, right? Well, the 10 year old is developmentally more mature. That's what we're talking about about building the capacity where we can handle more in life. Because if you're going to get to the next, let me give a simple example of this. Um, I like to say in a lot of different settings that our success in life is, among other things, going to be equal to our ability to confront. Confront. Now, we think of a confrontation as sometimes an angry discourse or, you know, we got to go confront somebody. We, get, we start to get amped up. I got a big confront. I'm going to confront this person. Literally, the word confront, the etymology of that word means to turn your face towards something. It doesn't mean de facto that it has to be a big fight or an argument or a war or anything like that. It just means we're going to lean into something. And, and if we can't confront problems, in other words, have, now listen to this sentence, have a positive valence towards negative things. I'm going to say that again. A positive valence towards negative things. Now, I don't mean we're happy about them, but that we're leaning into them. I wrote a book one time called Integrity. And integrity means to have an integrated character that we're firing on all cylinders. And one of the chapters in there about very successful people, the name of the chapter was they embrace the negative. In other words, when there's a problem, we hug it. In other words, we put our arms around it and say, what can I do to resolve this? How am I looking at it? How am I thinking about it? What's the proper response? What could be helpful? What could be redemptive versus what's going to make it worse? And that has a lot to do with how we're talking to ourselves. And you'll see some people, I was working um, in a leadership situation not too long ago, and somebody had to you know, do some very difficult decisions and, and this and the other, and some people were 
kind of, uh, you know, and huddling around this and the other. And, and I talked to the person that actually had to execute it. And I said, how are you doing? He said, well, you know, it's, it's not fun, but it's, it's part of what we got to do. And he said, I don't like it, but it's got to be done. And we try to do the best with whatever. And the capacity that he was, was illustrating was big. So we can do other deeper things on resilience, but I just want you to start with what, you know, the catastrophizing and look at it as simple as that, how we think about stuff and what language we use inside of our heads and to others has a lot to do with how big we're going to make the problem. In fact, one interesting little tidbit is, is, you know, the pain tolerance that people have in in some degree, and I think it's a significant degree. I haven't studied this in a long time, but but some of it is certainly people's constitutional makeup of how much pain they can tolerate. And when it actually beyond that registers as pain, okay, developmentally has a lot to do with the cues that they take from their environment as they're you know, pain evaluation is happening. Here's a simple example of, of that, because a, a child is looking outside to asking the question, is this bad? How bad is this? We all want to know how bad something is. But literally, when you're getting wired together, that's something that we take in and that becomes a structure inside. So take the, you know, the kid, the three-year-old that falls down. And a lot of times, if you've seen them, they'll fall down. And the first thing they do is, you know, their eyes get big and they look up and they look at mom or they look at dad and they're asking, am I okay? Is it? And mom and dad goes, Hey, get up. You're fine. Come on, let's keep moving. And they get up and keep moving. But sometimes you have a hyper helicopter. Oh, are you okay? And, and then, you know, everything. And then the kid starts crying. Right. Because we're learning by how we evaluate things, the level of of pain we feel. Now, in all of this, I'm not saying there's no such thing as debilitating, injurious, awful things that happen to people that literally will crack our souls. I mean, I've I've treated many, many times dissociative multiple personalities where the trauma was so much that a whole nother personality had to be created inside because you had to wall off the trauma. It was too much for the system. That's a real thing. People go into fugue states, they have blackouts, they have amnesia. There sometimes people have out of body experiences and I've had abuse victims tell, describe the abuse that they were watching happen to them from a corner in the ceiling of the room. Things are awful sometimes. But what we don't want to be doing, here's an old term from the cognitive therapy world, we don't want to be awfulizing things that aren't awful. Interesting from the marriage research. The basic problems that marriages that do well and marriages that don't make it the basic problems that they deal with by and large are the same set of issues. They just see them differently, interpret them differently, respond differently. You know, what's it about? It's about finances or it's about the kids or it's about sex or it's about the in-laws, you know, same stuff, different capacity to be able to deal with those. So watch your language. That'll be a clue as to, how big a deal we feel the deal is. Now, one more thing about this. We can go the other direction. You can minimize. And what gaslighting people do, what some narcissistic personalities do, is you will have real pain. They really are doing something hurtful. And they will minimize, oh, it's not that big. Why are you? And you can get minimized in the other direction. I just want you to work on appropriately labeling what's happening, because when you label it and put words to it, that does a lot to develop capacity to deal with it internally in the moment, as well as activate capacities that we either need or don't need. I can't tell you how many people I've dealt with that are depressed. And I'll say, well, you know, what's happened in the last couple of years? 
and they'll tell me awful things. And I'll say, what'd you do to deal with that? Oh, well, I don't know. Everybody goes through that. Or, and they minimize it. So this can go in either direction. So very, very important stuff from where I sit.